Hello everyone, this is Aries Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new Let's Talk Lore series titled Kongrong and the Seven Talents of Jianan, as we'll take an in-depth look at Kongrong's life and impact during the Three Kingdom era. Now as the title suggests, at the end of the series, we'll also take a brief look at the six other scholars that are often grouped together with Kongrong as the Seven Talents of Jianan, a term coined by Cao Pi. So without further ado, Let's get started with episode 1, titled A Smart Kid. Born in the year 153, Korong was a 20th generation descendant of Confucius himself, and in a society where the government embraced Confucianism as its ruling principle, Korong definitely had a leg up in life from the moment he was born. And aside from being just a descendant of Confucius, Korong's particular branch of the clan also had many notable members. Korong's seventh generation ancestor, Kong Ba, was the grand tutor for the second to last emperor of the Western Han Dynasty, and Korong's own father, Kong Zhou, served as the guard commandant in the Taishan commandery. As one of seven brothers, Korong would leave his mark in the history books at the age of just four, when he voluntarily picked the smallest pair for himself. And when asked by his father why he had picked the smallest pair, Koro answered that he was the smallest kid, so he should eat the smallest pear, and leave the bigger ones for his brothers. While this story might not seem like much, it became the case study example of filial piety among siblings, as the story will become immortalized in the educational text San Zi Jing, or the three character classic with the lines Rong Si Sui, Neng Rang Li, which translates to Rong at four years old, already knew how to share pear. While this would essentially become Korong's biggest legacy in life, his childhood did have a few other memorable moments. When Korong was just 10 years old, he followed his father to the capital city of Luoyang. And during his time there, Korong really wanted to meet the Confucian scholar Li Ying, who we covered before in our Fall of the Han lore series as he was one of the lead scholars during the first partisan incident against the eunuchs. And at the time, Li Ying was a celebrity amongst the scholars, and to avoid fanfare, Li Ying had ordered his doormen to turn away all visitors unless they had official business. So Koron, as a 10-year-old child, had no chance to get a meeting. But Koron didn't give up as he approached the doorman at Li Ying's estate and stated that he was a relative of Li Ying and thus requested a meeting. Hearing this, the doorman informed Li Ying and Koron was summoned inside. Once inside, Koron saw his idol, but had to explain himself. So in front of Li Ying and all his house guests, Koron stated that they were relatives because his ancestor Confucius was once tutored by Li Ying's ancestor Lao Zi, whose name was Li Er. So their two clans had been intertwined for generations, which makes him a relative to Li Ying. Now Li Ying was quite impressed by Koron's explanation, as Koron was allowed to stay for the day. Then when a government official by the name of Chen Wei visited Li Ying later on in the day and was told by the other house guest why a 10-year-old was hanging out in the state, Chen Wei made the offhanded comment that being a smart kid doesn't mean he will grow up a smart man. Hearing this, Koron immediately responded, Then you must have been a very smart kid. And this witty response made everyone present, excluding Chen Wei, burst out into laughter as Li Ying proclaimed to Korong that you definitely will turn out to be a smart man when you grow up. But before Korong would grow up to become a great scholar, the first and second partisan incident would greatly alter the influence of scholars at court as the eunuchs would become the dominant political force in the later periods of the Eastern Han Dynasty. And this shift would start to impact Korong's life when he was just 13 years old. At the time, his father Kong Zhou had already passed away, and thus Kong Rong and his family moved back to their home in the princedom of Lu. Then one day out of the blue, they had a guest at their door by the name of Zhang Jian, who was a renowned scholar, often ranked with the likes of Liu Biao. But because he had tried to expose the crimes of the eunuch 
Ho Lan at court, he ended up becoming a fugitive as Ho Lan escaped blame and then proceeded to retaliate by framing Zhang Jian for crimes that he had never committed. Then from that point on, Zhang Jian had been on the run, fleeing from one friend's house to another as he was trying to make his way to Donglai in order to catch a ship leaving for the northern frontiers. At the time, Kong Rong's older brother, Kong Bao, was a good friend of Zhang Jian, which is why Zhang Jian turned up at the Kong household. But unfortunately, Kong Bao was out of town. So not wanting to put the young Kong Rong in danger for hiding a fugitive, Zhang Jian didn't explain his purpose for showing up and decided to leave. But sensing Zhang Jian was in trouble, Kong Rong called him back and told him that even though his older brother was not home, he can still help him. So in the end, Kong Rong made the call to hide Zhang Jian in his home, and eventually the local garrison troops would come looking for him. And even though Kong Rong managed to sneak Zhang Jian out, Kong Rong himself was imprisoned and sentenced to death for aiding a fugitive. But before this sentence could be carried out, Kong Rong's older brother, Kong Bao, would return home. And after hearing what happened, he went to the local authorities and turned himself in, arguing that he should be the one who is sentenced to death instead of Kong Rong, as Zhang Jian was his friend and had came looking for him. Then seeing that two of her sons were in prison, Kong Rong and Kong Bao's mother also went to the local authorities and argued that both of her sons were just kids, and because their father had already passed away, they lacked the parental figure to make the right judgment call. So it was really her fault as the mother that they would end up aiding a fugitive, and thus she should be the one who should be getting the death sentence. And as all three Kong clan members clamored for death, the chancellor of the Lu princedom could not make up his mind, so he ended up asking the imperial court for the final decision. In the end, the court decided that the older brother, Kong Bao, was the one responsible for aiding Zhang Jian, and thus was executed for this crime. Now fortunately, Kong Bao's death was not in vain, as Zhang Jian would eventually make it to Donglai, where he would flee from the country, until he was finally pardoned after the Yellow Turban Rebellion, allowing him to eventually return to court. Sadly, along his escape, over 10 scholar families were caught helping him escape, and close to 100 people were executed like Kong Bao for aiding his escape. And this event would also cement Kong Rong's stance against the eunuchs, as he would eventually receive an imperial court recommendation and became the assistant to the Grand Excellency Yang Ci at just 17 years old. Here he would investigate the wrongdoings of many of the powerful eunuchs at court, and with the help of his boss, Yang Ci, Kong Rong would get the chance to present his findings at court. But sadly at the time, the eunuchs were already in the emperor's favor, and no evidence of wrongdoing was going to change that, as the end result of Kong Rong's investigation was the demotion of his boss Yang Ci from his Grand Excellency post to becoming the minister of the imperial household instead. Now Yang Ci got away with only a demotion because he was part of the powerful Hongnong Yang clan that would eventually produce members such as Yang Biao and Yang Xiu later on in the Three Kingdoms period. But for the next few years, Kong Rong would stay low and continue to work under Yang Ci until Yang Ci's death in 185. And along the way, Yang Ci would actually manage to work his way back first to the Grand Commandant position before returning to Grand Excellency just before his death in 185. Then after Yang Ci's death, Kong Rong would end up joining He Jin's court as one of He Jin's advisors before resigning from his post due to disagreements with a key imperial court official in Zhao Shu. But due to Kong Rong's fame and reputation, he would eventually return to court once again in 189, but unfortunately for Kong Rong, Instead of having to contend with eunuchs that controlled the court in the past, this time, he would have to contend with the tyrant Dong Zhuo, who had just taken control of the capital. And as we end our episode here, we'll return next time to cover how Kong Rong's opposition to Dong Zhuo ended up sending himself to Beihai, where he would earn himself the nickname Kong Beihai. So as always, hopefully you all enjoyed this episode enough to hit that like button to help support the channel, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!